Welcome back to Infrastructure Matters by IPWA, the pivotal space where the intricacies of infrastructure, asset management and public works come alive. I'm your host, David Jenkins, Chief Executive of IPWA, and today we're venturing into a dialogue that promises to reshape your understanding of the infrastructure world. And I'm delighted that uh, Richard Threlfall is joining us today, who's the Global Head of Infrastructure, Government, Healthcare and Transport at KPMG International. And I nearly, I met Richard um, first um, uh, in the Gold Coast at our Infrastructure Asset Management, International Infrastructure Asset Management Congress, uh, which he spoke to our audience, did an outstanding job. But Richard's got th- uh, nearly three decades of expertise in policy, governance, strategy and financing and stands at the forefront of addressing the climate and social emergencies through infrastructure development. His commitment to sustainable quality of life and his leadership roles, including chair of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure and Involvement with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, mark him as a pivotal figure in our journey towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. As we navigate today's conversation, we'll uncover Richard's perspectives on the future of infrastructure, the power of collective action and the innovative strategies that can lead us towards a more sustainable and equitable world. Let's dive into the conversation. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted that we've got Richard Threlfall uh, joining us today from KPMG, and he's joined us on a very sunny afternoon in Sydney. I think you've brought the weather with you uh, there, Richard, but um, <laughs> it's tipping down rain, but it's absolute, I'm so delighted to have you here today, and I know you've been on a busy, well, you are on a busy four-week um, journey across the world uh, into parts of Asia and New Zealand, so thank you ever so much for coming along and joining us on our Infrastructure Matters podcast. Now, I thought we'd start, um, and I've always taken a keen interest on the emerging trends um, that KPMG releases every year, and you've just released your 2024 uh, edition, and I just wanted to start the conversation with, uh, with a quote. So in, in, the, in the report, you said, and for existing infrastructure providers and owners to mesh their assets more effectively into the holistic infrastructure network. Now I'm going to pull out that, and I'm going to I'm going to I want to ask a sort of a, a bigger picture question here, in terms of how we manage assets and infrastructure assets. Do we need to be thinking more longer term? And if that's the case, what needs to change? And then there's this whole thinking around a systems approach to to infrastructure assets. So are we are we thinking about the the problems that will that we need to face and the solutions or are we still very much on a project by project basis so there's a number of questions there but sort of all intertwined into this whole thinking long term what, what's your views there richard david well look thank you it's wonderful to be in this conversation i do apologize for bringing very <laughs> english weather to the uh, center of sydney this afternoon um emerging trends as you know we've published uh, every january for more than 10 years now and it's been quite interesting to see how those uh, the themes that we touch on in those trends, we have 10 every single year, how they've evolved over time. But infrastructure mesh, I wanted to trademark the term, uh, I think it's the first time that we've talked explicitly about this concept. And, um, and I guess it's recognising um, the convergence of what had traditionally been separate infrastructure conversations, for example, obviously around energy in transition and how that affects transport, but also how this affects our Uh, and dovetails into our digital connectivity. Um, Maybe before I pick off some of your specific questions, let's just stand back a bit and and why are we having this conversation, right? We are um, uh, climate change, uh, rightly is concentrating the minds of infrastructure planners and operators all over the world. Um, uh, As we speak today, uh, we are about five and a half years away from the point at which on the world's current trajectory um, of carbon emissions, we will cross 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, at the same time, uh, we are particularly in developed economies, such as here in Australia or New Zealand, where I was last week, um, a lot of challenges because of aged infrastructure and not being able to bring the affordability today in order to invest. And then you've got the need for climate resilience of essential assets on which our communities depend. So so we've seen this incredible rise in demand for infrastructure investment all over the globe. Arguments over exactly whether it's 100 trillion or 90 trillion of dollars of investment needed in the next 10 years, huge sums of money need to be invested in infrastructure. And and what does that bring us back to? It brings us back to um, we can't afford to waste time or money 
in terms of our infrastructure development. Some of these challenges are existential to our societies. Um, we therefore need to make the right decisions about the infrastructure that we're going to invest in. And in order to do that, I believe passionately, we have to do that on a whole city or a whole country basis, the systems of systems that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. We need to understand as we uh, try to drive more electric vehicles into our cities, what are the effects of that going to be in terms of the demand on the grid system for electricity or our ability to be able to power them using renewable energy? Um, if we think about how we need to um, continue to build out our schools or our health infrastructure stock, how do we do that on a basis which is super efficient, uh, which draws on, uh, for example, modern methods of construction, um, again, so that we don't waste the money um, and the affordability of, of today's taxpayers to build the infrastructure we need? Can I, and, and can I just bring you up on a point there? So, and if we think about, so you're saying we think about whole cities whole countries and, and thinking about the problems and problems, not problems, but also opportunities in the future. You just mentioned electric vehicles. Are we building the right infrastructure for if, if that's a world that's going to that's gonna change and continue? How do you get a whole system? You've got funders, governments, um, construction, local government, people develop, managing. How do you get all of that on board the same idea of thinking long term because that's a lot of players and a lot of stakeholders to get on, on board with this. Yeah. So, so conceptually, I don't think this is difficult at all. But what it requires is some really good leadership. Yeah. Um, and increasingly, it requires um, adoption of digital tools and capabilities that we didn't have ten years ago. Uh, if you go back twenty years, running the London transport model for any scenario took about six months. Now you can create an entire digital twin of a city within a couple of weeks. So we have this phenomenal computing power, soon to be supplemented in a sort of AI world, which is capable of being driven at whole city or whole country level infrastructure opportunities. Um, but as you say, the th challenge of infrastructure is there's so many stakeholders involved, engineering, legal, policy aspects, financial and so on. It's, this is why I work in the infrastructure world. You know, it's, 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 it keeps you excited because of the intellectual complexity of it. But to line up all those stakeholders above all else requires government, whether that's at a federal or a regional or a city level, to be really clear about what they're aiming for. Mm -hmm. So take the electric vehicle uh, topic uh, that you mentioned a moment ago. Um, Europe has said 2035, by 2035, no vehicle can be sold within the EU that isn't a zero emission vehicle. That's the sort of clarity that's needed. And, and it doesn't really require a huge amount of the detail to be put in place underneath least, least that by the public sector. What it does is the industry to understand that that is an absolute commitment that they now need to work towards. And you could take that example into almost any other area um, of infrastructure development, I believe if government provides that clarity about the outcomes they're seeking, the market can then adjust in order to deliver it. And you might, and, and so you might have, uh, and you might have part answered this question. I'm going to ask next. Then, so how? And we just talked earlier about aging infrastructure and the issues around aging infrastructure. So how do you marry up the whole the, the premise that you need, you know, new new infrastructure to meet the future demands? but also managing your existing um, infrastructure assets appropriately because there's only a finite supply of capital or money and resources unless you ask more from the taxpayer. Or, so how do you manage that so that, that you're, you're doing both? I mean, obviously, as a professional body, we may very much advocate around you know, good asset management, asset management planning and linking to your long-term financial plan. But answer, yeah, I, I should let you answer the question. So, so I was in a fascinating conversation last week with the head of the New Zealand National Infrastructure Commission. Yep. Uh, the UK Infrastructure Commission has done some great work in this space too. And uh, the fundamental question we were kicking around was um, how do you create the maximum level of affordability, if you like, to invest in, in assets, whether those are new assets or whether they're the upgrading of, of existing assets. Um, uh, uh, and we agreed that 
the search for sort of new funding sources is probably the least part of the jigsaw. Mm. The first most important thing is how do you create the efficiency in build or maintain of your assets by adopting technology or encouraging the private sector to adopt technology so you draw down the unit cost of what you're trying to build. And the second area that really makes a big difference uh, is effectively managing the demand for assets so that, um, so for example, uh, you introduce road pricing, not primarily in my view, in order to raise money. You do it so that you spread the load on the asset, which is the road, so that it's not all peaking in one point in the day. Or if you create incentive mechanisms around when individuals are going to charge their electric vehicles in the future, you do that so that you flatten the demand on the electricity grid because actually that means that you need to build less new capacity because you're using the capacity that you've got far, far more effectively. So, so those two questions, how do we, as a, as a public policy maker, for example, how do we help smooth demand to maximise capacity? And how do we support the market to be as efficient as possible in terms of a sort of repetition of build, that's the way in which we square this circle. And how how do you, and you, you talked talk briefly just around um, government providing leadership around some of these things. This is the outcome that we want, therefore we're working towards it. I'm being very clear and specific. How, but in a world that operates in short-term political cycles, um, how do you, you know, and then you have changing, you have, the, you, have um, you know, the influence of politics and how do you manage that because, you know, infrastructure assets, we just talked about the importance of long-term thinking, changes of government, changes, changes priorities. How do you keep that despite the short-term political changes? How do you keep that consistency in that long-term thinking? Yeah. So, so there's inevitably a particular mismatch between political cycles within democracies um, and the needs of the world of infrastructure development and indeed operation. Infrastructure we know is a long-term game. It's a 30, 40, 50 year investment uh, horizon on, on major assets. So you have to have a degree of political consistency and stability. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've seen that's been quite encouraging uh, across the EU, in the UK, arguably even in the US, where political parties seem to be able to agree on almost nothing. <laughs> Actually, one of the things that they are generally able to agree on is the importance of infrastructure investment. Um, and, and I think there's also a growing awareness that, um, that the uh, threat to our assets uh, because of uh, climate change and the greater severity and frequency of climatic events, I, I think politicians across the spectrum can see that they can't ignore that because it will undermine the foundation of our civilization if we don't make sure that we protect those essential assets. Um, I think there's things that government can do that create governance frameworks that support uh, that cross-party consensus. Uh, I've already touched on the national infrastructure commissions that exist in a, a number of countries and obviously here in Australia at, at, at state level too, as, as, as well as uh, at the national level. I think there's a, those are super helpful um, in terms of driving a more um, objective uh, and a more uh, particularly evidence-based approach to infrastructure planning. I think that really helps. And in an ideal world, I think you try to back that up uh, within parliamentary systems so that you have effectively cross-party groups that then consider the reports that come out of those infrastructure commissions. What's, um, and I'm changing the subject a little bit here, but it's related to the climate change. And you, and you brought up climate change as being a, a big issue and a big input then into infrastructure. We're, we're beginning to see, um, and interestingly, Canada's sort of taken a lead on this, I think, around looking at green or natural infrastructure assets as opposed to grey hard infrastructure assets and using that as a way to counterbalance climate change and also you know there's a requirement now with infrastructure net zero and how we can how we can move that way and and, and nature and the use of nature n natural assets seems to be one way in which we can do that 
from your purview is it you know you're the global partner for infrastructure you see the purview of the whole world what have, have you seen do you see that as a an area that's increasing have you seen any particular examples where you think that's working well and, and sort of what's your general view or consensus and what are you advising clients around this particular area so this year's emerging trends in infrastructure was the first year that we included a particular trend around nature-based solutions um and, and my sense is that it, it isn't a conversation that's anywhere close to maturity yet, but it's absolutely coming. Um, and, and it ties into this whole demand to be able to achieve you know, better outcomes with, with perhaps less availability of money mm. or, or that money being spread more thinly. So um, we've had probably a, a decade of, of understanding that there might be a digital substitute um, for something that involves pouring concrete or, or building with steel, now we're starting to enter into a conversation that says maybe there's a nature-based solution that's going to, to drive that outcome. Um, um, or maybe it's a design solution. Uh, so I was in a, a fascinating conversation uh, in Singapore a few weeks back uh, where the uh, University of Singapore was talking about designing uh, their campus buildings in a way that would induce more natural cooling. Um, um, or there are cities that are starting to invest in planting trees in order to just reduce the temperature mm. in the city. Uh, and clearly the advantage of this is that you then start to save money, uh, obviously in terms of cooling systems and, and in turn the amount of generating capacity and demand that you need to try to provide. And, and when, you, when you started to talk about it in, in, the, in the report... One area that we um, find is a bit of a or found as a bit of a barrier is is it how there's no international standard with how you put these in, in natural assets on a balance sheet, um, and y you know if you want to drive change, arguably you'd need to you know you need the finance profession will, will sit there and go well how do I put that onto balance how do I value this? My question is how with some of these issues, long term thinking the introduction of nat natural, natural based solutions green assets it involves cross profession thinking it it's not just the engineers it's it's the um, it's the arborists the urban foresters it's also the finance profession how do we bring all those people on the journey to make some of these changes do you think yeah, so so it's coming um, i mean as you know i had the privilege of leading our global sustainability group for for a couple of years through pretty much aligned with the with the COVID uh, lockdown period. Um, and this is only four years ago, um, reporting by um, private sector organizations on things that weren't just financial disclosures was, was practically non-existent. And, and the big conversation was a fact around the fact that there was this plethora of voluntary standards that were just confusing everybody. Look how far we've gone in four years. Um, we've got to a position where uh, you've got you know, the SEC in, in the US uh, with obligatory climate disclosure uh, regulations. You've got the creation of the Sustainability Standards Board within the IFRS, uh, again, bringing out a series of disclosure standards. And specifically in the nature-based space, only last year we have the Task Force Task Force on Nature-Based Financial Disclosures uh, bringing out the conclusions of what was a three-year piece of work. Um, I, I work within a business whose origins are as an accounting firm, mm -hmm. even if that's not the majority of our, our business today. Um, we can see that we are now within only a handful of years from the point at which all organisations all over the world are required to report across a broad range of environmental, social and governance metrics alongside their financial disclosures. And I think at that point, a lot, of, a lot else of what you're, you're pointing at, David, will, will just start to fall into place because those companies will then need to work with their supply chains, mm -hmm. uh, need to gather the data. They will then make those disclosures. And depending on whether those disclosures show those businesses in a good light or a bad light, will then start to affect how successful they are as businesses. 
in t- in terms of capacity and capability, we've we've talked a lot about in IPWA how you build capacity in the sector and capability. Local government, um, you know, local government engineers that you know in short supply, um, getting people um, up trained, skilled, upskilled in, in in infrastructure asset management, and local government typically delivers um, and looks after uh, substantial assets in Australia and New Zealand. Um, how? From, from from your sort of viewpoint, how do you think we should be um, or could be developing capacity and capability and more? Um, what is that the educational sp- educational space? Is it does there need to be changes there? Is that a role more for professional bodies? Where where do you see um, you know where, where do you see that all playing out? It's a big challenge all over the world. The amount of capability, uh, particularly for projects that are becoming more complicated or particularly for projects that are of necessity becoming ones that cut across uh, traditional boundaries of disciplines. Um, And I think it requires professional bodies um, and major infrastructure owners and procurers um, to take a much more proactive stance in terms of helping to support the development of those skills or the reskilling within the supply chain in order to in order to to work in that space. Um, I think one of the the challenges that the infrastructure world has has always had um, is there isn't that much market power in the supply chain in the industry. Um, even the world's biggest construction businesses uh, have have their you know their moments of big challenge and in some cases go bankrupt. Um, um, they're price takers Mm. uh, in the industry um, and as a result of which the supply chain doesn't tend to invest nearly as much as it should do uh, either in skills or in technology and I was involved um, right from the beginning with the with the so-called project 13 initiative in the in the UK which was then adopted by the Institution of Civil Engineers Um, and, and, and that skewered what for me is the is the real truth in this which is it's the infrastructure owning organisations and procuring organisations, which in a large part is government, that has to take ownership of this space. Because if they don't, you will, we will never see the efficiency of the investment in the technology, nor will we see the investment in the skills that, as infrastructure owners, we're ultimately the beneficiaries of. And let's take that piece there just around the technology component. And you've mentioned this a few times. At a, at a very practical level, the influence, I mean, technology typically is, in whatever field, is around driving efficiencies, or should be. What, what in the world of infrastructure, or how in the world of infrastructure, is technology going to drive efficiencies? At what point, at what parts is it going to drive efficiencies? So, so I, I believe there's a technology play across sort of the whole of the, what we might call the infrastructure life cycle. Uh, we've already touched on digital twins, for example, and I yep. think the ability of digital twins to guide investment decisions as to what is the most appropriate infrastructure investment to make before we commit the billions of dollars is is, is significant. But the, the, the place where it will make the biggest difference is in the efficiency of build. Um, and uh, a lovely example that I picked up only a couple of weeks ago is around schools construction. So uh, in... Uh, in New Zealand, they reckon that, that to, ba- to build a new school at the moment is costing them something of the order of $9,000 a square metre. Um, they know of examples actually here in New South Wales where $4,000 a square metre is being achieved by driving that construction into um, an off-site factory environment and then effectively craning the craning the units in. Um, I, and I think... There's, there's a bit of a public perception and communication issue in this space. Uh, those of us who had some of our education in sort of demountable classrooms tend to think of off-site construction as in implying some sort of deeply inferior product. Um, but it was only a few years ago that um, a top-end Marriott hotel was opened in New York where every single uh, floor was craned in having been manufactured off-site. So... The prize here is a sort of mass customization market that moves infrastructure development uh, away from 
you know, the mud and some of the safety challenges of the site and moves much, much more of it into the design controlled environment of a factory where we can get a really top end product, but we can also get it at a much lower price. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here and, and I didn't say this before, but I'm just, I'm just want to ask you a couple of questions, um, sort of future thinking. If, if we were, if let's, let's roll it forward three years. Okay. So we're in 2027. What do you think your emerging trends reports going to look like in 2027? Gosh, there we go. Um, Hes- hes- hesitate to allow somebody to uh, jump in and publish it before we before we get there by revealing all of our secrets. Um, so this is interesting. It, I, I guess if we ask the question, what are the uncertainties that uh, the infrastructure world are grappling with today, which might have a degree of clarity by 2027? Mm-hmm. That's what I hope we'll be able to be. So to take an example, um, the the heavy vehicle market um, is still unsure whether their future is going to be a fuel cell future or whether it's going to be an electric battery future. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that by 2027 trends, we might be saying something that's much more definitive about that. Um, And with it, I'd like to think that we might be in a world where we're starting to talk more definitively about the rollout of, of, for example, hydrogen infrastructure globally. We're We're not in a position to do that now. Um, we talked about the immaturity of the nature-based solutions mm-hmm. market. I'd like to think by 2027 we'll be starting to write about you know, trends in specific examples of application, maybe in the water management space, for example. Um, uh, and then in this technology adoption area that we've just talked about, um, I'd be hugely disappointed if we weren't bringing some trends to the table uh, which are about um, not the theory of this, but how we are seeing sort of rapid rollout, um, particularly in the building space, um, and maybe pointing towards the linear infrastructure space as well of the adoption of that sort of technology. Thank you. And f- final question. Um, so it's obvious whenever you know it's obvious that you're passionate about this space, and it's and it's been great talking to you. I just on your four week tra- uh, trip so far. Um, is there been any conversations that you've had that you've thought, oh, that's taken me by surprise. That's a different way of thinking. That's not what I expected. Has there been anything that should, you can come away with and go, I learned something different there. There's a different way of thinking from any of the conversations you've had. And obviously you've been traveling across the world. I'm interested to hear that. So um, every time I, I have the opportunity to be in Singapore, there is something, <laughs> yeah. some conversation that has exactly that effect on me. And that was true two, two or three weeks ago when I w- was coming through Singapore to come out here. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation uh, with the government's chief sustainability officer. Um, and he was sharing the way in which the Singaporean government um, is leading by example. So, so they're not concentrating all of their effort on setting targets for others to achieve. Mm. Um, their their net zero target for Singapore as a country is 2050, like so many others. Mm -hmm. But for the government, they've set 2045. They've made it harder for themselves as government than they have for the country as a whole. And then what they're doing is they are publishing full disclosure of all the things they are doing in order to try to reach that target. He apologised to me for the fact that it was a bit warm in their offices because they've mandated that all government offices, um, the aircon will now be set to 25 degrees. Wow. Because if you can wear short uh, sleeve shirt and they save a lot of money and also carbon by not meeting the additional energy demand of trying to bring the temperature down to, to 22. That really impressed me. Um, and I'd like to think that other governments around the world might learn from that example. And that sort of comes back to one of your first points around government taking a leadership role in these sorts of matters. Absolutely. Rich, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you ever so much for making time in your busy schedule to talk to us. And um, I wish you all the best with the rest of your uh, journey and um, look forward to seeing you soon. The last time we saw each other was at the Smart Smart Cities in um, Barcelona and um, I think you were speaking there as well. So, But thank you sincerely and uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much.
As we draw this episode of Infrastructure Matters by IPWA to a close, I'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to Richard um, for his sharing his invaluable insights and profound knowledge with us. Today's conversation has certainly highlighted the critical role that infrastructure plays in shaping a sustainable future and the importance of leadership strategy and collaboration in achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We hope this discussion has sparked new ideas and motivated you, our listeners, to play part in this, play a part in this vital journey. For more thought-provoking conversations on infrastructure, asset management, and public works, stay tuned to Infrastructure Matters by IPWA. Remember, together we have the power to build a better, more sustainable world for future generations. I'm David Jenkins. Thank you for joining us and look forward to our next journey together.